Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the service this morning. We're glad that you folks have chosen to join us this morning. Let's take our, serv- our Bibles, please, and turn to number to Psalm 106 in our Bibles as we begin our service this morning and consider this a call to worship. This is considered, the book of Psalms is the Jewish hymn book. And so we consort, go to the Jewish hymn book as we begin our services each Sunday morning. And this morning, Lord willing, we're going to read Psalm 106, verses 21 to 31. Psalm 106, verses 21 to 31. And I invite you to read responsively with me, and I'll start it at verse 21. Of course, we're following the the nation of the history of Israel. And verse 21 says this, They forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Therefore he said that he would destroy them, had not Moses his chosen stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. But murmured in their tents, and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Overthrow their seed also among the nations, and to scatter them in the lands. Thus they provoked him to anger with their inventions, and the plague break in upon them. And we'll read verse 31 and end there. And that was counted unto him for righteousness until all generations forevermore. And we saw in the history of the nation of Israel, they forgot what God had done for them and brought great problems upon them, but there was a man who stood up in their midst. And on behalf of the people, Moses and Phinehas stood up and pleaded on their behalf, and God heard their pleas. Sometimes we may be living in a rebellious nation, a rebellious people, but one person can make a difference. One person can make that difference. May we make that difference in people's hearts and lives today. Let's uh, begin also by singing a song, Facing a Task Unfinished. We'll sing verse 1, verse 2, then the chorus.
heaven, we thank you that even though the nation of Israel forgot, and we have recorded for us what happened as a result of their forgetting, we thank you, Lord, that you have recorded it for us so that we can put into place as we look back to the nation of Israel with hindsight and 2020 vision, so therefore we can put things in place in our lives that we never forget. May we never forget the power and the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He suffered and bled and died on the cross of Calvary to pay the price for our sin. He shed his blood so that we could have cleansing and forgiveness of sins. And he rose again from the grave the third day according to the scriptures. So that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved today. We have great hope, great cause to rejoice, great uh, emphasis in worshiping you today. So Father, would you bless this time May we remember these things, and again, we pray, Lord, if there's anybody here or listening online and they've never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, may today be the day of salvation. And so, Father, we thank you, we praise you, you've blessed us with a beautiful day. May we not squander it on ourselves, but use it for thy glory. This is the day that the Lord hath made. It is the Lord's day. We are here to worship you. May that happen today. So, dear Holy Spirit, help us to do those very things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you're seated, would you welcome your neighbor to the service this morning, please? tonight, Lord willing, at 6 p.m. and in our evening service, we're going to be taking the time to remember the sacrifice of Christ for us on the cross of Calvary. So we'll be having a time of communion in our evening service tonight at 6 p.m. And we, of course, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then we invite you to come back tonight and remember that with us as well. The ladies' afternoon Bible study is going to be starting back up again this week, but it's moving to a different day. It's going to be on Tuesday, so ladies, the afternoon Bible study will be Tuesday this week at 1.30 p.m. Awana is starting up this week on Thursday. Cubbies, which is for children ages 3 and grade 4, ages 3 and 4, they need to be potty. Uh, you can see there will be at 2 p.m. The Sparks, which is for kindergarten to grade 2, will, and TNT for grades 3 to 5 is at 6 p.m. So you can tell our times have changed. The day remains the same. But our times are changing, so just want to draw your attention to that. Youth group will also be starting their suppers at 5 p.m. this week also. Please let Jared, Amy, or Matthew O'Donnell know if you plan to attend the suppers regularly so they can make sure that they have enough food. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer bulletin boards. If you would like to help provide meals for the youth group, they are expecting 8 to 10 people each week unless the numbers change. Attention ladies also... Toddler shower for Brooke and Naomi uh, on October 14th, so that's coming up in a couple of weeks. And a reminder also, too, that we are looking for a custodial engineer. It would require 6 to 12 hours per week, vacuuming, dusting, mopping, etc. If you are interested, please contact Mr. Killam for more information, and this is a paid position. So if, you, if you're looking for some extra work, uh, we have something available for you. Talk to Lester after the services or get a hold of him throughout the week. Now, Cooper. Where's my buddy Cooper? My nemesis. Where's my nemesis Cooper? Did he he take off? Is he upstairs? For those of you who are not aware, that is my son. And if he comes looking for you, you better do as you're, as you're told. <laughs> 
I think he's giving them what for and the how to. Come on up here, Cooper. You dessert stealer, <laughs> awards taker, good cooker. good cooker. Too bad he was baking. I still think your mother had a hand in that. As you know, I hold the silver spoon quite tightly in my grips. 2022 says Pastor Tim. <laughs> 2017 said Pastor Tim and Jordan McKay. 2023 has to say Cooper Sutton. Yeah. It's a little bittersweet this year because really I went home one day and said I know what I'm making for the dessert and Cooper's dessert was so much like mine it's not even funny. The only difference between my dessert and his I think, was peanut butter. <laughs> but for some reason, the judges like you more. I don't know why. So Cooper, I entrust to you the silver spoon. <laughs> Guard it with your life, because I'm gonna get it back somehow. <laughs> Even if I have to send Caleb to the house. <laughs> anyway, so Cooper, congratulations on winning the silver spoon. All right. Well, I don't think uh, there's any other announcements. Again, ladies, reminder about the Ladies Conference at New Brunswick Bible Institute on the back of the Bolton uh, for next week as well. So, or next month. So, or at the end of the month, actually. So, October 21st, 20th to the 21st. There, there's a date where it's on it. So that's on the back of the Bolton as well. We're going to sing a, a few songs now. Uh, we're going to sing a song that we haven't sung for quite a while, still sweeter every day. quite a while and we sang it last Sunday night and I'm hoping that you're familiar with it if not uh, I guess it's going to be a solo again but Psalm 150 praise the Lord
song. Hope that you agree with me on it. And anyway, so that's a song we're going to be singing. Well, let's stand and sing, change our posture just for a second, and sing number 122 in our hymn books, Standing on the Promises. Epistle of John, chap <clears throat> chapter 1, because there is only one chapter. The elder unto the well beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing from the Gentiles, nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loved, loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with uh, malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doeth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them. That, the war, that would and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. 
Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto you, or write unto thee. But I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends salute thee. Greet thy friends by name. Thank you, Jordan. You may be seated. You may be seated. We're going to sing one more song just to sort of change our, our, our tone just a little bit. And we're going to sing just the first and last verse of number 119, Open My Eyes. And I'm going to ask that on the last verse, when we sing the last verse, children may be dismissed to Children's Church. And if, if you have children um, below the age of grade one, that maybe you just that you can follow the teacher upstairs, and then that way you can just sort of sign them in, and then you can come back to the service. So that's for children uh, under grade one. Uh, we do need to have them signed in and out. So Children's Church on the last verse of number 119. Open my eyes. Mr. Children's Church now at this time. Father in heaven, we come before you now. And Lord, we're going from the part of the service where we have by and large been active and we have been singing praises to you. But now we come to that part in the service whereby we put aside all these things because, Lord, we want to hear from you. But the problem, Lord, is some of us, our minds are so active there are so many things running through our mind that we can't hear your voice. And so what I ask now in this moment, in this time, is by thy Holy Spirit, that you would remove the distractions, that we would make the conscious effort, Lord, to, to seek to hear you, because, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Your Lord, your word says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, to tell us how to live and to tell us what to do. That we may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So your word is important today. We need to hear from you. So help us. Smash the hardness of our hearts with the hammer of thy word. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. I want you to take your Bibles, please, this morning, and just begin, we're going to start off by just turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to be looking at a few verses of Scripture, and then we're going to be beginning a subject. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, we read this, and this is a special verse to me because it's really the life verse of my wife and I. When, before we ever got married, we established that this is our verse. This is the theme of our life, the theme of our marriage. 
And it says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the very foundation of our, our existence, our marriage, our life, our being. Turning back to the Gospel of Matthew chapter, 20, uh, Matthew chapter 7, please. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, and picking it up in verse 24, we read this. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings the people were astonished at his doctrine. Now just one more verse of scripture to Psalms chapter 11. The book of Psalms Chapter 11, or the 11th Psalm. Psalms technically don't have chapters. They have divisions. The 11th Psalm, Psalm 11, verse 1 is a beautiful verse. In the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. Verse 3 says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? What we're going to begin over the next several weeks, and of course we'll do this as, as we have chance in the month of October, in the month of November, that is our missions month. Missions month is about redeeming the time, and so we have been able to put together a list of speakers uh, throughout the month of November, most Wednesday nights, and every Sunday, speakers beginning to share about the need of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the viewpoint of we must redeem the time. So I'll not be speaking to my, to my knowledge as of right now during the month of November. And so for the, for the month of November, probably for the first couple of weeks in December, excuse me, month of October, first couple of weeks in, in December, and then into the new year, I'm going to be talking about foundations for the family. Now again, I promise you that if we are paying attention, every one of us are going to get our toes stepped on. It is not my goal and desire to upset you. It is not my goal and upside desire to make enemies because when a pastor makes enemies, it minimizes the amount of people who come to church and therefore he has to go find another job. That's not my job. However, having said that, I don't want to get to the point where I ever come to the place where I'm afraid to preach what the Bible says and afraid to preach what the Bible says on family. I will tell you first and foremost, if you ask my kids, I have not been a perfect dad. You ask my wife, I have not been a perfect husband. There's not one of us here who's been perfect. We've not done a great job. We all have places where we fall short and we wish we could go back and have a redo, but unfortunately in life you just don't get mulligans. But the goal of the, the, the study over the next little while is to teach us what the Bible says so that we can see what we need to shoot for. We've got to have something, a target to shoot at. And again, it's not about making us feel bad. It's not about showing us how much we have failed. It's about showing us what God's word wants of us. Now, having said that, God knows that we cannot live up to his standard. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He knows that. And he has grace. Where sin abounded, grace did that much more a uh, bound. And so it's about realizing that, okay, I have, okay, I fell short here. And sometimes some, if we can recognize it early enough, we can fix it. It's kind of like reading through Psalm 106. It tells us about the history of the nation of Israel and we see where they went wrong. And one of the things that they did wrong was they forgot about God and all the things that he had done for them. And so therefore they started doing their own things. And when they started doing their own things, they got off target and into a pile of trouble because the wages of sin is death. Always was, always will be. The wages of sin is death. But if we can look back and say, okay, that's what they did wrong, so that in my life, I'm not going to make that mistake. 
putting markers in our life so that we don't make the same mistakes. And I share this with a heart full of guilt because I don't want you to make the mistakes that I have made. I don't want you to make the mistakes that others have made. I want you to, we want to learn from each other's mistake so that we can raise godly families, so that we can truly experience the blessing of God. So I preface that to say this. That's what we're going to be looking at. And again, I, I, it's not my goal to make you feel bad because that's not at all, but to just understand what, what does God want and what can God do and then to realize that when we do fall short, the grace of God can help us. Amen? Amen. The grace of God. We're living in a day where mankind is trying to erode the foundations that are so clearly laid out for us in the word of God. It is nothing new, but it is something that has been gaining ground and speed over the last several years. Now, I'm going to read some stories, and these stories are nowhere near new. But I'm reading some of the stories because they address certain issues that are cropping up today. And I, I was just staggered at how, knowing when he preached this message and shared these illustrations, it just blew my mind that he's been bang on. This particular author said this, In 1934, the veterans of foreign affairs put up a cross far out in the Mojave Desert. It was a memorial to the soldiers who were killed in World War I. The cross stood only seven feet high atop a stony outcropping called Sunset Rock. It was literally in the middle of nowhere. To see it, you would have to leave Los Angeles, drive nearly four hours northeast, then turn south onto a two-lane blacktop road and drive for nine miles until you entered the Mojave National Preserve. More than likely, you wouldn't see any other travelers along that road. Once you arrived at Sunset Rock, you would be able to see the cross on top of that rocky hilltop. You wouldn't see any signs, inscriptions, or markers. Just a simple white cross is standing where it was placed for 80 years. In 2001, however, a former Park Service employee sued the government, demanding that the cross be removed. For 10 years, the legal battle ensued. At one point, a judge ordered the, that the cross be covered with a plywood box so that it looked like some billboard instead of a cross. But that wasn't good enough. For some reason, a lonely cross out in the remote Mojave Desert was so threatening to our national conscience that the American Humanist Association, the Atheist Alliance International, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, People for the American Way, and the American Civil Liberties joined in the campaign to have it taken down. The case would be battled all the way to the Supreme Court where on April 28, 2010, the court narrowly ruled by one vote that this little white cross was not endorsing religion and could remain on the top of that hill. Less than two weeks later, thieves went to Sunset Rock, cut the mountain bolt, mounting bolts, and got rid of the cross. Even in the Mojave Desert, where almost no one ever saw it, the cross was a foundation marker that simply had to go. In the U.S., there's the interfaith group called the American Clergy Leadership Conference, which was calling for churches everywhere to remove their crosses. Their spokesman said that the cross was a symbol of oppression and it represented an attitude of superiority. The desire of the unbelieving world seems to be to remove the foundation from our culture and the founder himself. Revisionist history is erasing from our culture the relationship of God to the fabric of our history. The trouble is, and the real danger to any culture and in any country, and Paul and the early church lived in it, is that when you remove the absolute proposition of the existence of a creator God, you invite to your own harm all sorts of danger and error. With the exclusion of God, the value of life becomes meaningless, and so we have the open promotion of abortion and medical assistance and suicide. People are no longer born male or female, but have to determine this, the, his or her own gender. And, they should they should, and should they choose to change their gender, they are applauded as courageous heroes. Marriage as we knew it no longer has definition according to Scripture. A Baptist church in South Carolina voted to allow the marriages of homosexual couples and opened the way for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender individuals to not only join the church, but be ordained and appointed to leadership positions. Of course, we do not have to look far to, in our own country or problems for examples like that. 
The church at large has picked up their own eraser, and with seeming abandon and delight, they are proudly erasing away as much of the foundations of truth as they can. Our media, public schools, and universities have for decades been willing instruments of propaganda to indoctrinate a generation in the normalization of evolution, atheism, and and immorality. Erwin Lutzer wrote about the daughter of one of his volunteers at Moody Church. The teacher of a public middle school class told the students to choose one side of the classroom and walk over to it. The teacher then said, this side over here is for the students who claim to be gay or support their gay friend's lifestyle. The teacher said the other wall on the other side of the room were for the bullies and then then made all the students decide. You either agree or you became a bully by disagreeing. They really ought to read the biography of Svetlana Statlin where anyone who verbalized a disagreement with any position held by the state simply disappeared. So what do we do? How do we respond? Someone has said in every generation, in every nation, to one degree or another, the church must answer this same basic, basic question, what do we do? Dr. Arnold Gableen, Bible scholar and author, called it the big the, bear, the burning question of our day. And he said that back in 1939. Therefore, it is my desire over the next little while to try to give us some biblical truths to provide a firm foundation upon which we can build our lives. You see, it's not about what I think. It's not my opinion that matters. It's what does God say. God provides the only foundation for our life. And if we try to build our life on something other than the foundation that God has provided for us in his word through Jesus Christ, we will end up ruining our lives. All we have to do is look to society and look to all the problems that we are facing today. Man is plagued with problems and they seem like every new week coming up with new problems and dilemmas and how are we going to deal with it. And we got to get back to the basics. I must build my life on the foundation of God's word because to do anything else is simply foolish. History has proven that. God has given us things in his word not to rob us of having fun, but to show us what's important, to teach us how to live a life, to how to have a happy life. I believe it's in John 13. I, no, don't quote me. If, I, if it's not found in John chapter 13, it's found in John chapter 1 of the teens. And you can just read it all this afternoon, come back tonight and tell me where it's found. But I believe it's somewhere in John 13 where it says this. Jesus basically says, these are my commandments. Happy are ye if you do them. He wants us to have a happy life. We've been reading through the Psalms. Psalm 1 starts off with this, which is a book on the experiences of life. And in the experiences of life, the book that's dedicated to 150 Psalms, dedicated to the experiences of life, the whole book starts off with this. Blessed is a man, Psalm 1.1. Blessed is a man, or happy is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law of the Lord doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. God wants us to be prosperous. He wants us to be well-grounded. He wants us to be happy. And the experiences of life, the only way we can be happy through the experiences of life is to build our lives and follow the word of God. God shows us how to be happy. And we wonder why society is so unhappy today. Why is is everyone so angry? Have you violated or have you left forgotten about the word of God? The nation of Israel in our reading this morning got into trouble because they forgot what God had done and what he had said. And we've got to come back to the basics. That's why we're going to look at the foundations for the family. It is my desire over the next little while to try to give us some biblical truths to provide a firm foundation upon which we can build our lives. Now today is just going to be the introduction. And I guess from the introduction you can determine whether or not you ever want to come back. I hope that you will. But as we consider foundations for the family and the importance of it, it is so important I want us to consider the choice we must make. In the introduction, the first thing I want us to consider is the choice we must make. If you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs chapter 14 or write this down and look it up later on. Proverbs chapter 14. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, we read this. 
the choice we must make. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. You know what? The beautiful thing is this in Proverbs 14, verse 12. It's not only found in Proverbs 14, 12, but it's also found almost verbatim in Proverbs 16, verse 25. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. I've never met anybody who, said, who came to me and said, you know what, Pastor? I, I'm, I want to find the worst decision I want to make because I want to make that bad decision just to make my life miserable. I'm so in tune to being miserable and rotten to the core that I'm going to make the worst decisions I can. I've never met anybody like that. But I've made all kinds of people who said this, I wish I had made a better decision. If we're going to have a happy and prosperous life and, and build families that will stand the test of time, build lives that will stand the test of time and not crumble and fall in the storms of life, then we've got to make a right choice. And there is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So we must choose God's ways. We must make a choice. I would either live my life God's way or my own way. Those are the two choices. And all I'm asking at the beginning of this time is this. If we consider foundations for the family, you make a choice. Are you going to live it God's way or man's way? If you want to live man's way, man, oh, you don't need the, the, the old fuddy duddies. Don't listen to that pastor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You can have that opinion. Don't worry about what the Bible says. The Bible was a book written thousands of years ago. It has no relevance today. Have you read it? It is amazingly accurate. Especially as it talks about the things that are going on and the nations that are going on, the technology that would be in place. And yes, just in case you've never heard it before, I've heard it all my life. I believe it's Revelation chapter 11. It actually talks about how we can have TV and satellite TV. How two people will be dead in the streets in Jerusalem and all the world will see it. You've got to have satellite TV for that to be possible. The Bible is amazingly relevant. He told us. And God's word never changes. If we want to have a happy life, this is it. So we, the choice we must make. I will either live my life God's way or my own way. It goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. They could choose to do it God's way. God said to Adam and Eve in the very beginning, hey, look at this beautiful creation. Everything I've created, you can have whatever you want, just don't eat this one tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. We know what happened. They thought maybe God was holding something back. They saw the tree, it looked good. Well, there's no harm in that. I'll eat it. So she took it, she ate it, and she gave it to her husband, and he ate it. Then all of a sudden they realized that they were naked, and God came walking to cool the garden, and they hid themselves. They knew they had done something wrong. Man got a guilty conscience from then. By the way, let's go back to this. A little bit of therapy for you. Guilty conscience, you know what a guilty con how to deal with a guilty conscience is? It's telling you you're doing something wrong, so therefore if you go back and fix what you're doing wrong, then you don't have to live under a guilty conscience anymore. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I have found in my, in my lifetime that most people know what they're doing wrong. They like to hide it and pretend. They don't want to admit it. But you, some, you know when you've done something wrong. Nobody has to tell you. You've got a guilty conscience. Anyway, make a choice. I'm going to ask you to make a choice. The choice we must make. Secondly, I want us to consider the consequences we must accept. So there's a choice we must make and there's consequences we must accept. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Sin is any want or lack of conformity to God and his word. If I choose to live my life contrary to God's revealed word, I will pay a price. There's a price to be paid. If it comes to raising my family, if I don't follow God's word, then there will be a price. There'll be a price to pay. Sure, I may have a lot of fun for a while, but it will come at a high cost. Why don't you turn over to Hebrews chapter 11, please, just real quickly. The consequences we must accept. You see, God has given us the freedom to choose, but with the freedom to choose comes the consequences of our choices. 
I can choose. Uh, listen, if you don't want to have anything to do with God's word, you have the freedom to choose and to go and do whatever you want to do. You have that freedom, but there is a price to pay. And we can't avoid the consequences. In Hebrews chapter 11, we're not going to look at the whole context, but there's, there's a whole context here, but just, there's just a simple little truth. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, we read this, talking about Moses. By, verse 24 says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. If I choose to live my life contrary to God's revealed word, I, I may have a lot of fun for a while. You probably will. But it will come at a high cost. Moses, here in Hebrews 11.25, chose to suffer affliction than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. Make no mistake about it. There is pleasure in sin, but only for a time. Only for a time. The prodigal son in Luke 15, he found that one out the hard way. He, he says, Father, give me my inheritance. I want to go. I'm tired of the rules. I'm tired of the regulations. I'm going to go live my life. I'm going to live it up. So give me my inheritance now. And he lived it up. And see, he had a lot of fun. Now, we're not told for how long, but he had a lot of fun. Until the money ran out. When the money runs out, where are your friends? When the money runs out, where are you going to live? And for a Jewish man, where was he found at the end of the story, near the end of the story? Feeding pigs. Eating the slop that the pigs eat. And you know for a Jew, there's nothing worse than that. That is the utmost insult. Degradation and defilement of life. He, he lived his life the way he wanted to, but when he lived his life the way he wanted to, and took him to a place he never thought he'd go. Caused him to do things he never thought he would do because he wanted his fun. It is fun for a season. My friends, I, I want to encourage you that you have the freedom to choose to do whatever you want today. But there is a price to pay. We must, the consequences we must accept. If I choose to live my life contrary to God, I'll have a lot of fun for a while. But you'll pay a price. A big price. A price that you never, that is, sometimes you come to the point and say, it's too high, I can't pay it. But you don't have that choice. But, so they will pay a price. But, if we choose to live for God, there are also consequences. Temporal, but nonetheless very real. When we choose to live for God, it will create friction in a world that is going against God. Joseph in the Old Testament suffered greatly for choosing godly choices. His brothers Hated him. They wanted to kill him. They stripped him naked and threw him in a pit while they wait, figured out what they were going to do. Then they sold him into slavery into Egypt. He was just trying to do the right thing and tell them what the word of God had told him. Because back then, Joseph didn't have a copy of the Bible, so God spoke through dreams and visions. Joseph received a dream and vision from God. He shared it with his brothers. They knew it had directly affected them. They didn't like it. And so they, they beat him and threw him in a pit. Then he went into Egypt um, he tried to do the right thing in Egypt, look out for Potiphar's household, but his, his Potiphar's wife wanted something that Joseph wasn't prepared to give him, give her, and she falsely accused him and had him thrown in jail. He paid a price for doing the right thing. But at the end of it all, he was highly exalted. If we follow God, if we choose to do it God's way, we'll pay a price. You cannot go against friction, against the world, and not pay a price. What's it say here? Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 12 says this, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. We will pay a price. And if we had the time, we would read 1 Peter chapter 4 as well, about paying a price. But it's only temporal. It's only temporal. So there, I want us, the choice we must make, the consequences we must accept, number three, the challenge we may have to face the challenge we may have to face. The challenge is simply that we may do everything right. We may do everything right. But when it comes to raising our children, they can still rebel. We can do everything right. We can do a, 
be a perfect parent and still have rebellious children. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 5. You see, because the problem is after our children get to a certain age, oh, sure, we have control over them for a certain time and while they're at home and while they're in school and we can sort of make them do certain things, but there comes a point whereby you can't make them anymore and they have to start making their own choices. I hate that phase. Do not like it. Because if my son would just listen to me, he'd have a perfect life. Or so I think. You should do it because daddy says so. That only goes so far. In Isaiah chapter 5. Now unfortunately, with the responsibility of becoming an adult, making their own choices, you see when they were children I could protect them from the consequences. But now that they're adults, I can't protect them from their consequences of bad choices. In Isaiah chapter 5, I want you to look at verse 1. God is speaking. He says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a winepress there. And, and he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And we learn that this is, God is speaking to his children. He says, and the nation of Israel has been like his vineyard. And he says, I have planted it. I have tilled it. I have nurtured it. I have done everything that I can so that it could have a a prosperous life and bring forth beautiful grapes. But they bring forth garbage. And God asked the question, what more could I have done? If you read through the prophets of the Old Testament, you see this. What happened? God, who is perfect, does God make a mistake? Does God make a mistake? Is he perfect in every aspect? And yet he raised a rebellious son, Israel. You can do everything perfect and still not end up with the results you wanted. What do you do then? Do you give up? No. They can still rebel. God had rebellious children, did he not? What more could he have done? And so that's the challenge that we may face. Which is why a plea to the children, a plea to the young people. Follow God's word. Seek to hide God's word in your hearts because when you get older and you start bearing the weight of your own consequences for the decisions you make, if you make bad decisions, it's not going to bode well. It will bring nothing but sorrow, suffering, and shame to your life. That's not what I want. And that's not what God wants. But you have to make your own decisions. So that's the challenge we may face. Now let me finish it off with the calming assurance we've been given. The calming assurance. Real quickly, turn with me, please, real quickly. I'm going to go through it. They'll be up in the PowerPoint. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. If you can't keep up with me, write them down. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Having said all that, let's consider the calming assurance we've been given. Realizing the fact that we may not have perfect children and our children can grow up and make their own decisions and they may make decisions that we don't like even though we've done everything right and perfect, they're still going to make their own choices. What what does God say to us from that? In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, we read this. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The calming assurance is this, we've been promised the presence of God. We have the presence of God. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Look at verse 6. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We have the promises of God. So we have the presence of God and the promises of God. 
We don't have to be afraid. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I have the promise that God is with me, he'll strengthen me, we'll get through this together, and I don't have to be afraid, and I can trust him. I have the presence of God, and I have the promises of God. And if you follow God's word, you have his promises and his presence too. Not only do I have the presence of God, the promise of God, Philippians 4.13 says this, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I have the power of God. If I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior, the power, the strength that I need to move forward, to make those hard decisions, to when you're hurting and and mourning and you don't know what to do because you have children or or whatever, maybe things aren't going the way you wanted in your perfect little world, what do you do? God can give me the power and the strength to keep moving forward and to keep living and not give up. See, that's what the devil wants. He wants you to give up. But we have the calming assurance. If we know Jesus Christ and build upon his foundation, we have the calming assurance of the power of God, the path of God's word. I was going to turn to Psalm 119, 105 to 112. 105 says this, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I don't know what to do, when I don't know where to go, look into God's word. He will direct me. He will tell me and show me what to do. And that's why we're building on the firm foundation of God's word because he will show me what I need to do. The calming assurance and the planting of God's seed. Matthew 13 says this, that Jesus talked about a parable. Sower went forth to sow and he sowed some seed. Some fell on good ground, stony ground, uh, bad ground. You You can read the chapter. But the seed was planted. And in time, if it hasn't been plucked up by the crows, if it was able to get into the seed, the soil of the heart, it will grow. Proverbs 22.6 gives this verse. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart. If we plant the seed of God's word into their hearts and lives, it will bring forth life eventually. It will bring, by, bring forth its accomplished purpose. But we've got to plant the seed. And the se- as long as we have given them the word of God, the seed has been planted, and God can take it from there. The calming assurance. As a pastor, the one thing I'm committed to doing is preaching the word of God. It is the foundation for our lives, the sure foundation. As a church, we must promote this foundation. As a people, we must choose this foundation do you want this foundation? It, becomes, it begins by coming to Jesus Christ first for salvation and then for surrender. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of Jesus and doeth them, he will be like a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Now, the question is this. What choice will you make today? Will we build our lives on the firm foundation of the word of God and our families? Or will we do it the world's way? The choice is now yours. Father, we come before you now and we ask that you'd help us to make this important decision. Maybe there's somebody here, Lord, and they've never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and they just feel like they're going around in circles and Life has no meaning or or sense of purpose and they, they just, maybe, Lord, they even feel like ending it all. Help the Lord to realize that that's not the answer. The answer is first coming to Jesus Christ, confessing their sin and calling upon Jesus Christ to save them. And Lord, thank you for that promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Help them to make that ever-important decision today. 
And maybe, Lord, there's somebody here, maybe they're a young family and they're just starting out and they're wondering how they're going to navigate through this because this world is becoming a, a dark place. Help them, Lord, to be committed to building upon their firm foundation and training up their children in the ways and the things of God and planting the seed of the word of God in their hearts at an early age. Help them, Lord, to be committed to that path. And Lord, as, as older people, may we come alongside the younger people who are struggling and help them and encourage them and, and be the, the comfort and the strength and the help that they need. Lord, maybe there's some of us here tonight and maybe we've just made a big mess of everything because we have forgotten about your word. Thank you, Lord, that there is cleansing and forgiveness. And Lord, where we have failed, you promise your grace is sufficient. So Father, just pour out your grace. Lord, you know that it is my desire and prayer that for my children, that you would be their conscience, their guide, and their stay. I can't talk to them anymore because they're adults. But may they learn to listen to you. And may that be all our desire to learn to listen to you and build upon the firm foundation, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There's a song in our hymn book entitled number 131, The Church's One Foundation. And I would invite you to stand and sing with me, please. Just the first verse of The Church's One Foundation.
Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed. Renewed from and from the grace that I found in you. And Lord, I come to know the weakness I see. Stripped away by the power of your love. Oh.